I heard earlier in our conversation, you talked about how so much of, let's call it the moat, right, of California as a state, but also the United States as a country is yeah. our academic institutions and both the attraction um, that comes with, you know, people from other countries wanting to come here and sure. educate themselves and also the right. resources and uh, sort of the way that enables the youth here yeah. in the country. Yeah. What do you think about, you know, recently there's been a lot of political tension in regards to sort of the speech climate in universities and mm -hmm. what some would argue is deterioration of, let's say, standards of excellence at universities. I I'd love to get sort of like your perspective on. Well, so I, I have a, <laughs> I went to Columbia College, Columbia University, uh, last all-male graduating class uh, that was defined decades ago, over 100 years ago, by what was called the core curriculum or the Western Civ program. Uh, long before that, you had to pass exams in, in Greek and Latin to get into certain school, schools. Columbia was 1754, one of the oldest Ivy really? League schools. And the core curriculum had its antecedents, well, in the 1890s, but really in, in, in after World War I, where it was like, oh my God, what happened? What was this thing, World War I? Which is something you can't study enough either. Yeah. Uh, and war issues and literature and and um, political science you know philosophers uh, became a bigger component of it it's something that adjusted over time during the 1960s it was like why, let's stop studying dead white men let's introduce feminist thought and and buddhism and other things and now it's it's different than it used to be when i was there it, it, mine was still more dead white men um, but there was a lot to be said for Everyone going through this rite of passage and studying the same thing. Graduate schools liked Columbia graduates or Chicago graduates that adhered to this because they knew you weren't just taking electives that you were good in, that you actually had to take these hard classes mm -hmm. that meant your GPA was more reflective of hard classes than just the things you were good at, right? Um, where am I going with this? So, so the question is, say today, with, uh, and I had dinner the other day with some friends from Israel. <clears throat> And they can't believe what's going on. And uh, I was biting my tongue because there is this, there is this issue, say, say in 1983, in the late 70s and early 80s, with apartheid in South Africa, which is viewed as the same as apartheid with Palestinians in these locations in Gaza, you know. And there, there wasn't the vehement reaction. We weren't seeing pictures of, of, of the images, right? It was still on the front page of the New York Times. We didn't really, it was far away. We didn't know what was going on, but we opposed it and we protested. And today, I think the generation that is born in 2000, like my youngest daughter, uh, doesn't have that same sensibility and that connection to certain events. And that's a function of history. And I think you know, education now, I would love to see a course like that post-World War I issue on, on war studies, which is a social psychology course. You're, You're talking about interdisciplinary. Well, yeah. Sensibility to past events or current events? Well, well current events. Oh, okay. like, like, I keep thinking about what's the hybrid course that everyone, instead of punishing everyone, I guess you could suspend students if they made direct threats to other students. You could, you could do that. Okay, you're gone this semester, come back and take this course or make everyone take this course on war studies to understand, you know, the kind of the history, history of conflict. Mm -hmm. um, but there's First Amendment freedoms. I mean, that's what this country is about. Protesting, labor protesting. It's a, it's a very hard needle to thread. And, you know, the more we move away from these events like the Holocaust and World War II, uh, the more abstract they become. You know, at the very end, Eisenhower, the president, er, the general, dictated 16 millimeter footage of, of Birkenau and Auschwitz and um, all of the, the camps because he said, someday people aren't going to believe that this happened. And sure enough, you have Trump and his acolytes saying, oh, it's all a hoax. So we have to inoculate again. Again, maybe the only thing to study is history. Mm -hmm. Maybe all these other things you can study when you're 35 years old, but study history now. So just to see if I understand your point of view, is it sort of that there's a lot of perspective and also, um, I don't know if resilience is the right word, but let's just say, you know, if you're a generation that was born close to World War One or World War II, yeah. you're familiar with what it is, what, it, what it's like to process very graphic and sort of evil information and as we move past that there there isn't this generation of young people that sort of know how to deal with what it is what what, what it means to have an event like this and i'm seeing like babies dead or like well no, i guess online. what i'm saying is for for the case of the holocaust you know i was born 15 years after mm -hmm. world war ii 
And so the New York Times and all the big papers at the time, again, before social media, they had articles or obituaries on something about World War II and the Holocaust virtually every day of my life. Really? I was immersed in it, right? It was the big story. And it still is. You know, if you read the New York Times, you'll probably find something, some reference to World War II. It was just the dominating event of that century. And so even if you weren't Jewish, for example, you had this appreciation for everything they went through. Yes, there was the Armenian genocide, and there was, there was all of this happening all the time, you know, everywhere. But in that, in that way, you know, it's in your bones, anyone Jewish or not Jewish. And as people die, as the people who survive the camps die and move on in life, you know, the next generation doesn't have that connection. It's sort of in the museums now. And unless, unless it's kept alive, uh, we do run this risk where, you know, when when the uh, the MIT Penn and Harvard presidents were were grilled, I mean, they were being grilled by some very cynical Republicans, in my view, but they didn't have the they had a very lawyerly answer. You know, they didn't come out and say, this is terrible. You know, it talked of genocide and identifying an ethnic group is horrendous and horrific. It shouldn't happen. You know, they probably could have said that and kept their jobs. But then the next step for me would have been, okay, create that course on, you know, I, I was interested in arms control and disarmament, same thing, right? Conflict. Create that messy interdisciplinary course of sociology and ethnicity and demographics. I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to quit my day job and work on that class right now. That would be my dream job, you know, but, but, but I think you've got to, to assuage and allay the concerns of, of um, the donors, you know, universities are complex environments. Um, you've, you've got to do something like that. Dwight Eisenhower, who won World War II, became president of Columbia, and he said, God, this is the hardest job I've ever had. You know, you're pulled in all these directions by all these different disciplines and departments and alumni that want more spent on football. And he said, this is an insane job. You know, give me the government. Give me, give me another yeah. war to manage.